Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of the Hugo Winners 1963-1967, to edited by Isaac Asimov. Dane reads... Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of the Hugo Winners 1963-1967, to edited by Isaac Asimov. So I read this because I'm a huge Asimov fan, although really the only bits he has in it is like his introduction and an introduction to each of the stories. Um, but there are some cool authors in here as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you the blurb. I'm going to go through and check out my tabs. I don't have a huge number, I'm afraid. And then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, the Hugo Winners 1963-1967. to the Hugo Award is to science fiction what the Oscar is to Hollywood, and each year at the World Science Fiction Convention, the coveted statuette, modelled after a spaceship, is presented to the author of the best short story of the year. In this anthology, Isaac Asimov has compiled the prize-winning stories from the 21st to the 25th conventions. They are The Dragon Masters by Jack Vance, No Truce with Kings by Paul Anderson, Soldier Ask Not by Gordon R. Dixon, Repent Harlequin, said the TikTok man, by Harlan Ellison, the Last Castle by Jack Vance, and Neutron Star by Larry Niven. So let's jump on and take a look. And so we get a publisher's note here, which confused me a little bit. The Hugo Winners Volume 2 originally appeared in America as a single giant book. In order to offer this excellent collection at a reasonable price on the UK market, it was necessary to divide the book into two sections, running from 1963 and from 1968 to 1970. So here I have section two, except this is volume one, this is volume two. It's all very confusing. So the, the introduction to Volume 2 was used in Volume 1 for some reason. Uh, I didn't have too much to know about the first story, Jack Vance. So we have No Truce with Kings, and I noted here something from uh, Asimov's intro, so I'm going to read that out. So he says, um, To be specific, Paul knows that I am a fuzzy-minded pinko, and I know that he is a narrow-minded hard hat. Not that either of us would ever use such terms. But we love each other anyway, and our relations with each other in these last couple of years have not suffered at all. May I point out that to disagree without rancor and to engage in rational argument without emotional disintegration is a faculty that need not be confined to the science fiction world. It would be great if that large world outside could boast of it as well. Yeah, I agree. And then, so we get this little bit here, that musing on war. Uh, it doesn't have any headers, so it's hard to tell which story this is a part of. I'm gonna... I don't know. How, how, long, how long is it gonna make me flick back? So this is the Paul Anderson story. And we get... By now I'm a father, he thought, and I've never seen my kid. At that, I'm lucky, he reminded himself. I've got my life and limbs. He remembered Jacobson dying in his arms at Maricopa. You wouldn't have thought the human body could hold so much blood. Now maybe one was no longer human when the pain was so great that one could do nothing but shriek until the darkness came. And I used to think war was glamorous. Hunger, thirst, exhaustion, terror, mutilation, death, and forever the sameness. Boredom grinding you down to an ox. I've had it. I'm going into business after the war. Economic integration as the boss man system breaks up. Yes, there'll be a lot of ways for a man to get ahead, but decently, without a weapon in his hand. Danielis realised he was repeating thoughts that were months old. What the hell else was there to think about though? So here we have uh, the introduction to Gordon R. Dixon. Again, because I'm an Asimov fan, I found the introductions almost more interesting than the story. So this is the intro on Gordon R. Dixon. I'm just going to read the whole thing, I think. Gordon Dixon is, in some ways, a man of heroism. I once received one of his paperback books in the mail with a form card attached which asked me to read it carefully and write back all the things wrong with the book so that he could improve his writing next time around. Now that's heroic. Of course, it's also idiotic and I wouldn't have a thing to do with it. Suppose it set a precedent. I made my own position quite clear. Anytime anyone reads one of my books and spots something wrong with it, I'll thank him to keep it secret. I don't want to know. When I ask for criticism, all I want is applause. I hope that's clear. Then too, Gordy has the fictional hero's ability to be unaffected by the strong drink that is, on rare occasions, forced upon him by his convivial and loving friends. When that happens, his general glow of benevolence merely glitters more brightly. It was only last summer when Lester Del Rey, one of the bantamweights of our field, in physical proportions only, not in talent, looked pretty poorly and I was convinced. Looked pretty poorly and I was concerned for Lester is one of my favourites, even when he's talking, which is all the time. I said, what's the matter, Lester? And he said, I tried to outdrink Gordy. Lester, I said, shocked. You only have half his volume. I almost did, he said. He almost died is what he should have said. But my most poignant memory of Gordy is in connection with the 1959 convention at Detroit. Robert Block was so busily engaged in getting ready to introduce me to some girl I had never met that I suspected something was up. I managed to locate the girl and I must say I was staggered. She was 5 foot 11 inches tall. She was beautiful and she made Anita Ekberg look like Audrey Hepburn. I saw the plan at once. I was to be introduced, and after one goggle-eyed look, I was to fall into a speechless catalepsy, thus utterly ruining my reputation as a dirty old man. 
Remaining master of myself only by an eyelash, I approached the young lady with diffidence, introduced myself in a quiver, and humbly asked if she would cooperate with me in a bite of it routine. Being as good natured as she was beautiful, she agreed. So, when Bob Block introduced me, I calmly walked up to her and snapped my fingers. She put her arm about my waist, swung me back, she was bigger and stronger and had to play the lead, and we kissed. It was the talk of the convention. With that beautiful head start, you would think I was all set, wouldn't you? Nonsense. Rotten old Gordy Dixon moved in and cut me out, leaving me in the Arctic region somewhere. The funny thing is that I forgive him. He's lovable too, you see, in a completely different way. And we get this great line in this story. Fanatics, when all is said and done, are no worse than mad dogs. But mad dogs have to be destroyed. It is a simple common sense. Alright, and then here we have the introduction to Harlan Ellison's story. Harlan is flamboyant. He's got the fastest, sharpest tongue in science fiction. What's more, he knows judo, karate and foot play, and packs 180 pounds of gristle, sinew and muscle into a body that weighs 120 pounds altogether. Don't ask me how, but he can get into a fight with three bruisers, non-science fiction ones, each of whom is bigger than he is, and come out the winner. But he's a sport. He only picks on those science fiction personalities who have developed the reputation of being able to take care of themselves. Would he ever pick on Gordy Dixon, whose chief weapon in wit to wit combat is a charming grin? Would he pick on Larry Niven, whose slightly puzzled frown is his only defence against a grim world? Never. You know whom he picks on? Me, that's whom. From the other side of a huge ballroom, he sees me and I can hear him coming all the way. Mercy? He doesn't know the meaning of the word. He can ring every possible change on my waistline, for instance, just because it has a kind of sturdy expansiveness. I tell him over and over I need all that room to keep my spare brains in, and he makes very ribald remarks about where I probably keep them. And you know the excuse he uses? He says I make fun of his height. I never! Would I ever dream of mentioning that he is 62 inches tall? Oh, he denies it, but if he stands on tippy-toe, he is. Far from making jokes about his height, I've said a million times, and in public too, that Harlan's height is no laughing matter. Which reminds me that I remember Harlan when he was even younger than he is now, and just a fan, and a lot skinnier and more elfin. He used to scurry around the convention as quick as Quicksilver, and everyone else had to be careful not to trip over him. Everyone knew he was special. Everyone knew he would go places. The question was what to do with him meanwhile. We never found out then, but I think that since then we've learned. Thus, at a convention just about a year ago as I write this, a young boy of 16 showed up. He was skinny, sharp, self-confident, articulate, and had an IQ that sounded like 200. A bunch of us looked at each other fearfully and one said, he's another Harlan Ellison. And someone, whose name I won't mention except to say that it was Robert Silverberg, said, let's kill him now. So yeah, the Hugo winners 1963 to 1967, as you can tell I found the introductions to the stories a lot more interesting than the stories themselves. It was my first time with a lot of these authors, in fact I don't think I'd read any of these authors before, so that was kind of interesting. But overall, I've got to say it was a bit of a disappointment, and to me it kind of hammers home the fact that award ceremonies kind of pointless, like I don't think they were a particularly good indicator of quality, especially not in this case. So I gave the Hugo winners 1963-1967, 3 out of 5, but if you're interested in it, I guess go ahead and get it, it was, you know, killed some time. So there we have it, that's what I made of the Hugo winners 1963 to 1967 by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.